here this evening in Hochen Lake. Uh, some folks say that a Sunday is the, the day of rest. And they say but as far as the believer is concerned, that's really the way it should be anyway. It should be not indeed a day of rest. A, a day in the, the palace is just worshipping and praising. A day also witnessing and testifying. And also finally today, a day of learning from himself and from his word. I want again to go back to Acts chapter 2, please. Acts chapter 2. We've had some joys in Elam Hall today. This morning we had a young brother, Charlie Banks, received into Assembly Fellowship. And then in the, the afternoon there at four o'clock we had a young, a young husband and his wife baptised. And, you know, that has given me some thought, actually, just to look again at Acts chapter 2, just to see the pattern for a believer and also the pattern for the place where a believer should meet and should be gathered. And I think really we find that in these verses in Acts chapter 2. The church has only begun, beginning in Acts chapter 2. The Lord has been crucified. The Lord has been buried and raised from the dead. And then the Lord again has ascended into heaven. And we discover then that his followers, the disciples, they have come forth again. It must have taken great guts for the want of a better word for them to come forth again after seeing what happened to their Lord and to their Master. That they come forth again into the city of Jerusalem and they begin to preach the gospel. And we're going to break in now at verse 37 of Acts chapter 2 now. When they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about three thousand souls. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles, and all that believed were together and had all things in common. Now, we'd always know that the Lord does indeed bless the reading of his precious word. As we said, the disciples, the followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, they had come forth and now they were preaching the gospel in that great city of Jerusalem. Many, many folk at that time in the city. Many, many folk hearing the gospel preached. And we discover after they hear the gospel preached, it says this in verse 37. Now, when they heard this, they were pricked in their hearts. You see, that's what the gospel preaching does. It disturbs the heart. It disturbs the sinner. And I know I've already preached the gospel this afternoon, but I wonder, you know, does the gospel do that to you? I look around now and I see faces that were sitting under it this afternoon. I wonder really what effect the gospel message had upon you today. The effect it had on these people was this, it disturbed their heart. You see, the heart is the seat of affection. The heart is that which affects the rest of our lives. The children's chorus really is true, isn't it? Into my heart. Come into my heart. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. Come in today. Come in to stay. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. So I wonder today, even now a couple of hours or so, after you've heard the gospel preached, I wonder today, did it disturb your heart? Well, I remember... It disturbed my heart. And again, I had heard the gospel so many, many times. But there comes that time. There comes that time when you respond to the message. And this is what it was as far as these folks were concerned. 
Now again, perhaps for many of these folk, this was the first time they had heard it. The first time they had heard it. And yet God is gracious. God is faithful to these folk. And it does, disturbs their heart after they hear the preaching of the gospel. Then we hear really what that disturbance of the heart should cause in verse 38. Peter says unto them, Repent and be baptized. You notice the order there. You notice the order there. It's repent and be baptized. There are places of worship today and they baptize without repentance. When I think of the ages of some of these folk who are baptized infants, how can it possibly be? How can it possibly be that repentance has taken place before that baptism? No. The disturbance of the heart first when you hear the gospel mentioned. After that is repentance. Repentance. What does that simply mean? Well, we asked the boys and girls that this afternoon, didn't we? It just simply says this, to be sorry. To admit that you are a sinner. To admit that you are a sinner. And come to the right place with that. Come to the foot of the cross. Come to the right person. Come to the Lord Jesus Christ. So first of all, again, we say in verse 37, we have sin a sinner. We have sinners who hear the preaching of the gospel. And that causes a disturbance within the heart, within the soul. And the instructions are given. Repent and be baptized. You see, there is no other way. No other way. Because it says this after the word baptize, it says every one of you. Every one of you. There is no other way but repentance and baptism. Again, verse 39 reminds us that as well. It says this. Verse 39 says, For the promise is unto you and to your children. I think there are at least three generations of the one family within this room tonight. The first generation, the gospel was the exact same message to them. Repent and be baptised. The second generation, the message exactly the same. Repent, be baptised. Again to the third generation, repent and be baptised. My mother-in-law celebrated her 96th birthday the other Saturday with four generations in the house. Four generations in the house. And sad to say, of these four generations, some are saved and some are unsaved. But no matter, it says this, the promise is unto you and to your children. Can I say to parents today, can I say to grandparents today, the promise is to you as well. The promise is this, live before them. Sometimes we're just saying to John, it's difficult to speak to them at times. Sometimes barriers come up. Barriers which you don't understand, barriers which you just cannot take. You know, the Apostle Peter, Peter talks about enemies and strangers, sometimes can be strangers and families, just simply because all the generations don't believe and don't accept God's word. But you know, it says this, the promise is unto you and to your children. The promise we must take comes from God himself. There's no one excluded from it. Absolutely no one excluded. And it's great really to think of that. that there's no exclusions as far as salvation is concerned. Verse 40 says this, of course, it is individual. It is individual. And with many words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourself. Save yourself. If you could save your children, you would do it. If you could save your grandchildren, you would do it. If you could save the person sitting next to you tonight, you would do it. But you can't. You can't. The pattern is this. It's individual salvation. And I wonder tonight again, we say it's not the gospel meeting, the family service is finished. But nevertheless, here within these words is this. You must save yourself, friend. You must save yourself. It's the only way. It's the only way it can be. So the pattern, as far as belief is concerned, you were disturbed in your heart. You have instructions for salvation. Instructions is quite simple. Repent and be baptised. We've also discovered already that it's the only way. Again, the children quoted the verse today in singing, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. But by me. 
Verse 41 says this, And they that gladly received his word were baptized. This is true obedience. This is true obedience. First of all, they received the word. What does that mean? Not only did they hear it, but they received it. They took it for themselves. They realized that they were the sinner. They realized that individually they had to come to the foot of the cross. They realized that individually they had to repent. They received the word and they were baptized. I wonder this tonight, is there some sitting in this room and they have received the word? You have repented of your sin, you have believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, but yet this next step, the step of baptism, has never, ever been taken. You know, it is a command. It is a command. And what happens with a command is expected to be obeyed. Expected to be obeyed. What would it have been in some of these great world wars if commands had been given and troops had not obeyed these commands? Failure? Lost in battle? He said we believe that if we don't follow the commands of the scriptures, then we do lose. We are the losers of it. We are the losers of it. And I say again, it's a command to be baptized. And I wonder again, in true obedience tonight, those of us who are saved and who are not baptized, please, 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 just take the word from the scriptures and be baptized. But you know, there's a third step. The third step is this. And the same day, they were added unto them about 3,000 souls. We did it might be in 2015, that might be the case. But nevertheless, we're just happy this morning that Charlie Banks was added to the fellowship down there in Neelam Hall. I wonder again, perhaps there are those who are saved. Perhaps again there are those who are baptised tonight. But yet, yet you haven't become part of the company here in Auchinleck. It's expected of us again. Expected of us again. Again, you become part of a family when you are born into the family of God. And part of that family is dwelling with the family, staying with the family. And that's all the congregation are here in Park Road in Auchin Lake. They're a family, they're a congregation who make up the local church, who make up a local church. A place where God has placed his name. A place where God knows his people are gathered and a place where we should be gathered too if we are saved and if indeed we are baptised. And they continued steadfastly. Continued steadfastly. What does that mean? They just kept going. They just kept going. Sometimes, you know, that's difficult at times. Sometimes family matters come in. We can't get there. Sometimes work matters come in. We can't get there. We know, what about priorities? What about priorities? I wonder where my priority is as far as being part of the local fellowship down there in Elam Hall. I wonder, is there times when I just say, well, we'll just sit back, we'll not bother going. I wonder if there are times when I maybe don't want to go, but my wife will say, you're going. Sometimes, you know, that's what happens. Sometimes that's what happens. Continued steadfastly. That's what it means. Some folk referred, of course, to fellowship as being fellow rowers in a ship. That's the way the old ships used to be. Lines of rowers pulling and pulling and pulling and pulling. And that's the only way in which that ship got along. The only way in which it got along because everyone was putting their weight behind it. And again, that's what it means just to continue steadfastly. It says this, continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. Continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. You see, that's what it should all be based upon. All be based upon. For years now, we've had traditions. For years now, dare I say, we've had brethren traditions. But you know, now we should be based upon Scripture. 
based upon Scripture. The Apostles' Doctrine. The Apostles' Doctrine. Not men's thoughts. Not men's thoughts. The teaching given by Christ to the Apostles. The teaching given by the Spirit to the Apostles, which is confirmed in the Epistles, the letters that they wrote, that is what, indeed, the place should be based upon. So it's a place of teaching. It's a place of doctrine. It's God's school. It's God's school. It's where we should want to come to. Now, it's a long, long while since I left school. A long, long while. But you know, after the Salvation's Day, again, we should be, should be in God's school. It should always be our desire just to learn. To learn what God has for us. To learn what the Scriptures say to us. Again, another part of the Scripture speaks about the child getting milk. And that's the way it is to begin with. Perhaps tonight you're not that long saved. Perhaps tonight you're not that long baptised. Perhaps tonight you're not that, that long in assembly fellowship. And perhaps tonight you say, well, I just can't take it all in. You're not expected to take it all in. But what you are expected to do is to read it. And with God's help and with the spirit of God's help, just to try and to understand it. But it also says not only is it a place of doctrine, but it is indeed a place of fellowship. As we said, pulling together. A place of fellowship, a place of friendship. At one with each other. At one with each other. Now again, if you look at earthly families, that's not always the case. Not always the case. I've lost touch with, dare I say it, most of my family. So it's not always the case that we're at one together. But that should never be the case as far as the local church is concerned. We should always be at one with each other, working together, enjoying time together, loving each other together. Then it also says this, that in the breaking of bread and in prayers, a weekly, regular breaking of bread. Why in the breaking of bread on the Lord's Day? That's the day of triumph, isn't it? It's the day of triumph. That's the day when the Lord rose from the dead. So no matter, no better day just to celebrate the fact than the first day of the week, just to break bread, just to remember simply, just to remember simply that he came into this world he gave his life, he shed his blood, and that's the only way in which you and I have redemption of our souls. I wonder how you felt this morning. I wonder how you felt this morning just in the breaking of bread. I wonder how Charlie Banks felt this morning just in the breaking of bread. I did a bit of travelling, as you know, and work, and I used to meet a Mrs. MacDonald up in the Isle of Skye. She was brought up in the Free Church, brought up in the Free Church. And she said to me that the first... Sunday, the first Sunday, she said, the first Sabbath, as she said, after she accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as her Saviour, the first Sabbath that she broke bread and took the cup was a tremendous experience to her. You know what I had to do? I had to confess to that dear woman. I really didn't have had that experience because I'd been brought up in the thing and some way or other it passed over me. But I've learned since that day, I've learned since that time that that's the experience it should be in the Lord's day. That's the way it's been. Oh, have you enjoyed that experience? I say again, are you part of the church here? Are you part of the local company here? That's the pattern set out for you. Hear the word. Be touched in the heart. Repent. Baptise. Add it to the company. And enjoy these experiences. You know, there are those out in the world to tell you today that the believer has a sad life. There are those out in the world today to tell you that the, believers will tell you, that the unbeliever will tell you to get a life. To get a life. You know, my friend, there's no greater life. No greater life than know that the Lord Jesus Christ is in your heart. No greater life to know that you're part of that fellowship and to enjoy the company. I was saying to Robert earlier on today when discussion, really that's what that's what keeps me going. Some days you do wonder about your salvation. Because you look at your life and you look and you see what you're doing in your life. But that's what keeps you going, just the fellowship of saints. The company, the company, just to enjoy the company of each other. A place of triumph, a place of triumph. But you know, are you searching for a place today after salvation? Are you searching for a place today after your baptism? You know, the only place to find what that place should be is in the Scriptures. 
First of all, we discover if we're looking for a place, it should be a place of teaching. A place of teaching. First Corinthians chapter 12, 13 and 14, it says this, concerning spiritual gifts. Concerning spiritual gifts. You know, there are places today where it's one man ministry. There are places today where those would take the pulpit and they're most certainly not believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. And you know, that should not be the place where you're seeking fellowship, where you're seeking God's people, where you're seeking to be after that day of salvation, after that day of baptism. God has given gifts and these gifts are exercised, exercised in the place. Exercise in the place. And that takes us back again to indeed it is God's school. The assembly should be God's school. Now I know we've all got the Holy Spirit in us. Again that tells us that in Acts chapter 2. We receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. That is a once and for all reception. At salvation. That very moment of salvation you receive the Holy Spirit within your life. And that Holy Spirit is able to teach. He's able to teach. And there is indeed that individual learning. Have you sat down today in your home? Have you sat down today and just sat with the Word of God and read it and just let the Holy Spirit teach you? There is that individual teaching, that Holy Spirit within each and every one of us. He's able to teach. He's able to take the Word of God and he's able to teach us what the Word of God means to each and to every one of us. But you know there's also God's school within the place here. And again that's where it's exercised. It's exercised in the teaching. Teaching given, given from the platform. Teaching given perhaps from Bible study, Bible discussion. I wonder do you make yourself available to that? Or you made yourself available tonight? Is that a regular thing? To make yourself available to the teaching given, given by the place given by those who have been given the gift of teaching, you make yourself available to that. So first of all, if you're looking for a place tonight where you should be, where God would seek you to, seek you to be, then first of all we discover this, it should indeed be a place of teaching. But you know, it's also a place of witness. A place of witness. There's a young church to be found in Thessalonians, Thessalonica, I see a young church. It possibly was only about 18 months old when the Apostle Paul went along to it. And yet he discovered this. It was a place where the gospel was being sounded forth from Macedonia and Achaia. Now, if you look at the marks on the back of your Bible, you discover this. The Macedonian and Achaia, they were far bigger even than the land of Scotland. Now, I know that once you go by Fort William or something like that, there's really very, very little witness and testimony as far as local churches are concerned. But you know, can you imagine it from Auchin Lake, the whole of Scotland and larger than that being touched, being touched. Well, you see, that's what Thessalonica was doing. It was touching the whole area. How it was doing it? How was it doing it? It was finding ways to do it. It was a port city. And no doubt there were folk, the believers would be down there at the ports. And they'd be speaking to those men and perhaps those women who were on the ships. And these men and these women, they'd be receiving the word. And then they would take it. Take it. But where did it start? It started in the local place. It started in Thessalonica. And from there it sounded out. And it went forth. I wonder today, again, there is individual testimony and witness. I was saying to Brother John again that I've discovered now after two and a half years in working in an office, I found it difficult actually to be in the proximity of folk for working. But now I've discovered I've got to speak up for the Lord. Because if I don't speak up for the Lord, they'll certainly speak against them. They'll speak against them in their language. They'll speak against them in their attitude and in their ways. So again, we've had to learn just to speak up for the Lord. So there's that individual testimony and that indiv individual witness. Sometimes we've got to make that. We know also from the place here goes forth and sounds forth the grand old story of the gospel. So again, you're looking for a place tonight. Again, it should be a place of teaching where the word is taught. Not men's ideas are taught. Not traditions are being taught, but simply where the word is taught. 
It should also be a place from where the gospel is being sounded forth. If the gospel wasn't sounded forth, what would happen to the place? What would happen to the place? Well, it's good that our families sometimes, sometimes believe and are added to the company. But oftentimes that doesn't happen. I've got a daughter. I've got a daughter. Believed, baptised, added to the company. Worked with her father in the Sunday school. Come to the age of 21 and said, no more, no more. I've got a son who in tears would tell his mum and dad that he can't live the life. He couldn't have lived the life. It doesn't always happen, you know, that the families come in. So if that doesn't happen, we must go forth. We must sound forth. We must go and tell. Go and tell the people round about us. From you sounded out the word of the Lord. It's a corporate testimony. We should witness as individuals. But as a place, again, we must find ways we must find ways of going and witnessing and testifying to the outsider. But you know, it's also a place of government. It's also a place of government. First Timothy chapter 3 and verse 15 says this, Thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of the Lord. It's the house of the Lord. It's the house of the Lord. And there is a way for us to behave ourselves in the house of of the Lord. How's that guided? How's that controlled? We well, see the Lord raises up shepherds. The Lord raises up shepherds. Shepherd to lead. Shepherds to guide. Now we're very careful in the words that we're using there. Shepherds to lead. Shepherds to guide. Not shepherds to drive. Not shepherds to drive. I remember coming round Tung and Thurzo one day and round a corner and there was a sea loch and in that sea loch was a flock of sheep and behind that flock of sheep was the shepherd and his dog. What was he doing? He was driving his flock, driving his flock across that water. They were getting there. But I'll tell you something, they wouldn't have been very comfortable getting there and that's what he was doing, driving them. His intention was that they would get across there and there he was driving them along with his dog across that sea loch. That should never be the case. It should never be the case with shepherds within the place. Shepherds should guide. Shepherds should lead. You'll notice again I'm saying shepherds. It's plurality. It's plurality. The same way as there is no room for one man ministry. Again, as far as the scripture is concerned, there's no room for one man shepherding. No room for one man shepherding. And again, you know, we're not born into it. There's no family line. No family line as far as shepherding is concerned. And we're not voted into it either. We've just passed a year where there was great voting taking place in this land of ours. And we're just now a matter of weeks again where great voting again will be taking place. I was out a walk last week in Galston and I ran into Cathy Jimerson. <laughs> she asked me, what are you going to vote for? <laughs> I said, well, I know who you are, Cathy. I know where you come from. And it wouldn't matter who you were or what you were. I wouldn't be voting at all anyway because I just don't vote. I've got a better government than what you will ever have. But, you know, it's not no voting as far as shepherding is concerned of the assembly. No democracy. No democracy. It'd be a dangerous thing, wouldn't it? Dangerous thing. Who appoints the shepherds? The great shepherd. The great shepherd himself. And it also says this in Acts chapter 20. Take heed to thyself. Shepherd tonight. Take heed to yourself how you guide. Take heed to yourself how you lead. Why? Because you will answer for it. You will answer for it. The great shepherd himself will hear. Hear what you have to say. As far as your shepherding is concerned. So again tonight you're looking for a place. A place where you should be. Again, it should be a place of teaching, a place of witness, a place of government. You know, a wee bit stronger word now, a place of discipline. A place of discipline. First Corinthians chapter 5 speaks about that. 
a place of discipline. All sin is judged by God. That's what First Corinthians says. All sin is judged by God. After all, my sin has been judged by God. And if tonight you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, your sin has been judged by God. We know, unfortunately, again, there comes times within the church when that sin is also to be judged by the shepherds. Also to be judged by the shepherds. See, again, it says in verse 6 there, a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. How do we prepare ourselves to meet with the company? What's it like the other six days of the week? Do we prepare ourselves to meet with the company? Do we realise, really, that individual sin in my life can affect the corporate company, witness and testimony? Again, we said that to Charlie. You've got a responsibility now, Charlie. You're only at school. But nevertheless, sometimes, just sometimes, when we say we belong to a company, look at our lives and they say how can it possibly be how can it possibly be we must understand we must understand that individual sin can affect the company they're looking on they're reading they know where you go they know where you claim to be and what you claim to be and yet we still live our life before them not realising that that will indeed affect affect the company. It says this in verse 7 of 1 Corinthians chapter 5. It says this, purge out the old leaven. That's a strong word, isn't it? Purge out. Purge out. Cleansing by removal. Cleansing by removal. It's very strong, that. Sometimes we do wrong. Sometimes we sin and we just think, well, we'll just stop doing it. We'll just stop doing it. And we discover this, we don't stop doing it because we don't purge it out. We just try to get rid of it. We just try to stop doing it. The scripture tells us this, purge out, purge out. So we've got to discipline ourselves to cure the matter, to cure it, and to recover, recover from it. You see, the Lord will never let us down, but unfortunately we let the Lord down. Unfortunately we let the Lord down and again we say that indeed again affects affects the place but I say again to perhaps to someone tonight who is looking to come into a place don't worry about that statement a place of discipline because if we live our lives according to the scriptures if we live our life according to the apostles doctrine then we will never ever need to fear never ever need to fear the fact of Discipline. It's a sad day. Again, we say to this, say again that discipline should always be towards recovery. Discipline should always be towards recovery. There should never be a case. There should never be a case where discipline happens and we say, well, that's it. That's it. No more. It should always be a case of discipline towards recovery. But, you know, perhaps the best of all and the greatest of all is this a place of love. Should be a place of love. First Corinthians chapter 16 says this, let all your things be done with love. Also says this, my love with you all. Are our, our, all our actions, as far as the local church is concerned, are they all governed by love? Do we all love one another? Sometimes that's difficult, sometimes that's hard. But that's what the scripture says. We should all love one another. Now, way back in the 1950s, there was a song in the charts. It was this, love is a many splendid thing. Love is a many splendid thing. It was a theme song for the movie in 1955. It was top of the charts in 1955. It won Academy Awards for the best original song and it sounded good it sounded good there was an American reporter who fell in love with a Eurasian doctor from China but encountered prejudice from her family in Hong Kong and everyone looked on that film and I say again it sounded good and it worked out but in the background in the background what was happening what was happening 
While during production, despite the romantic subject of the film, the main actor and actress could not get on with one another. From the outside, it looked good. From the outside, it sounded good, but in the background, in the background, the two main participants, they weren't getting on with one another. Holding the main actor, he chewed garlic before close-up scenes. You can imagine what that must have been like. But he was determined to destroy it. He was determined to waste it. He could have stopped doing it. He knew that the scene was about to be filmed. He knew the scene was about to be taken place. But what did he do? He went and he took the garlic just to cause disturbance. Oh, you think, well, that's typical. That's typical of the male. But you know, Joan's the main actress. She complained about her makeup, which she said made her look too old. Trivial things. You know, sometimes trivial things spoil the fellowship. Sometimes trivial things spoil the love one for another. And sometimes we're determined, just like this man was, we're just determined to destroy the fellowship. I hope really that doesn't apply to either Rohan Lake or to Elam Hall. I really do hope that. That we're not determined just to destroy the fellowship. And we're not just using trivial things just again to destroy the fellowship. Looked all right from the outside, but in the inside, in the inside, these things were going on. What does it say again in one of the, the churches? You've lost your first love. Where should our love begin? Our love is for Christ, and I think that's the first love that they lost. They appear to be doing everything all right. From the outward appearance, they were doing everything all right. They were cr crossing the T's and they were dotting the I's. But it says to that church, it says, I'll destroy you because you have lost your first love. You love Christ today, don't you? Do you love each other? Do you love one another? Or are you determined just to destroy that fellowship, to destroy it altogether? 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 13 says this, The greatest of these is love. And I do believe that tonight, while we've come to the place of love in the last of the list, I do believe that if that last of the list was sorted out and was correct, then the rest, the rest would indeed fall into place. And the place where we gather, the place where we meet, indeed would be better. You know, Genesis chapter 28, Genesis chapter 28, just to finish off with, we find that man called Jacob. That man called Jacob, and he's laying his head down just to sleep. Just to sleep. And of course he has that vision. He has that vision. And it says in verse 15, God, it says this, God will keep thee in all places. God will keep thee in all places. And there's two words here for the word places. God will keep thee in all places. And all throughout your journey of life, out your, throughout your earthly path, when your earthly journey, God will keep you. No matter what place God finds you in, God indeed will keep you. Of course, again, in verse 16, it says, The Lord is in this place. That's a different place. The Lord is in this place. No, friend, tonight, I do believe that. The Lord is in this place. The Lord is in this place. Because God is determined that his name should be here. God is determined that his name should be here. And it's a special place. It's a special place. God is in this place. That's what makes it special. Because the Lord is in this place. Place. It's all different, but just simply because where he is. Again, Matthew's gospel says this, where two or three are, to gather, are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. But you know, it also says in verse 17 of Genesis chapter 28, how dreadful is this place? How dreadful is this place? Do you feel the dreadfulness of the place when you come in? Why should it be dreadful? Why should it be dreadful? Because the holiness of God is seen in the place. Or the holiness of God should be seen in the place. The holiness of God is here. It's to be found in this place. But you know, verse 17 also says this, it's the gateway to heaven. It's the gateway to heaven. That's what the place is as well. The gateway to heaven. It's the place where God loves to meet with his people. And also the place where the people should love to meet with their God. It's a gateway to heaven. Verse 19 says this, it called the place Bethel. Called the place Bethel. Is the name important? I don't think the name is important. I don't think the name is important at all. What is important 
The important thing is this, that he is in the place. He is in the place. That's what I'm concerned to, to look at, simply as I said, because of our reception into the assembly this morning and also because of baptism. And I do believe that is a pattern. Hear the word. Hear the word. Repent, be baptised, be added to the company, and the company should be the place which is indeed taught in God's word. I do trust again that the ministry has been some benefit to each and every one of us tonight. I do trust again that we might just take it home and we might look at it ourselves. And if we are looking for a place, then indeed we might find it to be so as it is in God's word. Just let us have a short word of prayer. Our God and our Heavenly Father, again we come into thy presence. We thank thee again for this day spent in thy presence. We thank thee again for that time of worship this morning. And again, if I we can remember the coming into the world of thy Son, the Lord Jesus, we can remember that sinless, that spotless, that perfect life. And again, we can remember that all the way to Calvary, when he gave his life, he shed his blood. We thank thee again for that time of witness and of testimony as well. And we do pray again that as the gospel was preached today, wherever, We'd ask again, our Father, that some soul, man, woman, boy or girl, our Father, might have taken to themselves, and even now, our Father, might have repented of their sin. Now again, our Father, we do leave again. We've come into the school of God tonight, and again, we've opened up thy word. We'd ask again that teaching might have come from thyself. And we do ask again, our Father, we may all be blessed in that teaching. And our Father, again, we might go forth from this place being the better of it. Now, Father, take us all home safely, give us journey and mercies, watch over in the closing hours of this another day, and if it be thy will, bring us again to another day, another day of service for thyself. So again, Father, we give these things, and we ask these things now in thy Son's worthy and precious name. Amen.